started. So uh, welcome to uh, Dean Ford's Interdisciplinary Research Seminar Series sponsored by the uh, CTSI. My name is Ralph Sacco. I'm the director of our CTSI and the program is being recorded. So uh, remember, this is a Zoom. I think everybody is expert in Zoom now, but please try to remain muted and keep the video off. We will uh, take questions. There'll be a discussion period at the end. Try to put your questions in the, uh, um, you know, the chat feature to submit questions uh, during the presentation, then we'll get to them towards the end. Um, so um, it's really a pleasure to introduce um, um, one of our speakers, um, both of our speakers, but uh, it's always a pleasure to introduce Dr. Fernoni, who's one of our stars, as you know. Uh, Dr. Fernoni is a tenured professor in medicine and, and, the, and molecular and cellular pharmacology at our University of Miami. She's chief of the CATS Family Division of Nephrology and Hypertension and serves as the uh, director and chair of the Peggy and Harold Katz Drug Discovery Center. She's also associate director of the Medical Scientist uh, Training Program and is a co-director of, as you know, our Miami CTSI KL2 and mentoring program. So it's always great to introduce somebody of our own in the CTSI. She has a specific experience, obviously, in kidney disease, but also um, took a sabbatical with Roche uh, and uh, Hoffman LaRoche in Basel, where she was a global head of discovery in cardiovascular metabolism. And you're gonna to see today in this presentation, uh, she is the true uh, translational scientist and uh, teamwork in terms of um, taking uh, things from the bench uh, to the bedside. She's had a number of grants, as people know, um, and uh, has also received a number of awards, including a member of the American Society for Clinical Investigation and the Association of American Physicians. Um, she has a, a bio that is, is too long for us to go through everything right now. Uh, and hopefully many of you know her, of her tremendous work and pioneering work, particularly in insulin signaling, uh, cholesterol metabolism, and sphingolipid related pathways. Um, and some of the work you're gonna hear about today is really a uh, trend setting. Uh, in terms of targeting fatty kidney disease with small molecules um, and may really open up a whole new way of uh, treating kidney disease. Um, and she's joined by a colleague that I learned they actually met together when they were at Hoffman LaRoche and Marco Pronato, Dr. Pronato is senior lecturer at the School of Pharmaceutical Sciences, University of Geneva in Switzerland and formerly at Roche. Uh, Hoffman LaRoche in Basel, Switzerland, where I think uh, they've continued, they worked originally together, and obviously now in uh, taking this work to uh, and that translating it into um, a compound, uh, hopefully soon to be used in patients, uh, you'll hear about that whole uh, relationship and really the discovery and the approach to taking the small molecule um, to the patient in bedside. So without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Alessia, and I think she will share her screen. Thank you, Ralph, for the very kind, Dr. Sacco, for the very nice introduction. Um, let me put this on the presentations mode. Uh, one moment. So the, the, the topic of the presentation today uh, um, will be about uh, um, how can we target fatty kidney disease with most molecule and do fatty kidney disease exist? And I choose these particular slides that it's actually in the Ateneum of Bologna. This is uh, Malpighi receiving a, an award from fame and virtue for discovering the glomerulus, which is really the functioning unit of the kidney we will discuss today really stressing the importance of how innovations last forever and should be uh, uh, pursued. In fact, uh, um, this is my disclosure light. I'm a strong believer that in the absence of conflicts, we will have no innovation. So I've been working with uh, several companies uh, uh, working in the field of uh, uh, kidney disease, mostly rare kidney disease, as well as I receive uh, research uh, dollars from pharma as well as from the NIH, and I'm a shareholder of some companies that are developing uh, my invention. The objective of the presentation uh, that uh, Marco and I will give today will be to start from understanding and appreciating how the interaction with the industry can promote innovation in academic center, 
will then discuss uh, uh, the science leading to the discovery of fatty kidney disease. Uh, I think we are the promoter of this concept, just like we have heard for many years for, about fatty liver, but we have never heard about fatty kidney disease so far. And then we will discuss the pathway from targeted identification to drug development, and this will be done mostly by Marco. Let's get started about the interaction. In general, my overarching vision about biomedical research is as such that partnership between academia, pharmaceutical companies, biotech firm, foundation, patients, and their family are really what's going to change the nature of biomedical research. And it's really by working together that we can actually make it happen. When I joined academia, I felt like academia and industry were two enemies with the academia one side focused on discovery science, on the interest in disease mechanism, education, clinical implementation, running trials for industry, while industry was really responsible for drug development, commercialization, focus on the mechanism of action of drug, adapting the science to the business. And I got to discover that this is not really quite true, that actually if, if in academia we, are manageable, we can manage to engage industry, we can empower our mission. So the scope in academia is mostly training and education of our trainees and junior faculty. The scope in industry is more linked to business. And there are areas of empowerment, discovery research, shared innovation, translational medicine, which is so much of interest in our CTSI, and education innovation. So with the scope being different, there's actually no conflict in working together. I also learned that it's very important to engage patients in our science and placing patients at the center of drug discovery is actually a motto that the FDA recently released uh, where as experts in what it's like to live with their own condition, patients are uniquely positioned to inform the understanding of the therapeutic context for drug development and evaluation. And so one thing that I've learned uh, um, uh, is that engaging patients early on and the community is extremely important because patients are really the dynamo that turn this wonderful wheel of medical knowledge that goes from bedside where we apply existing knowledge, we apply evidence-based medicine to the bench where we actually generate new knowledge and back to the patient. So that we, we can really run this wheel faster, bench to bedside and back if we engage patients. And we have been engaging patients successfully. We have actually, uh, uh, as an example, in Miami for the disease that we are studying and we will present today, we have organized a research rally meetings where we bring patients in a nice venues with their family. Uh, we, edu we educate them. This is a, a symposium we did at the Marine Biology Campus for patients affected by Alport syndrome, where we made this beautiful t-shirt for the affected kids, separated by rarity, united by knowledge. Everybody got to learn and educate about the disease. And uh, we also engage celebrities. You know, when celebrities are affected by disorder, this is a lonesome morning, affected by one of the diseases we study, focus segmented glomerulosclerosis. And Alonso one day show up in the office and say, hey doc, would it make sense to call it Alonso disease uh, rather than focus segmental glomerulosclerosis, which is so difficult to, pro to, to pronounce. And we are working towards the possibility to actually change the name of the disease. But really engaging celebrity can have this kaleidoscopic effect uh, uh, if uh, they allow to borrow their fame on our science and our ability to translate. And, and finally, I think it's very important to make choice to pursue our vision, to match the academic persistence with innovation, to avoid being trapped in this, uh, um, in this uh, loop between uh, chasing publication, prestige, more funding, more resources, more data back to publication, raising our H index. I understand this is needed, and that's why I say it's a match. It's not a replacement, but we can actually empower that academic growth with the ability to work with pharma and, and somehow jump over this value of that in translational medicine where the wonderful knowledge and academic freedom that allow us to make new discovery would go in a, in a, in a hole unless actually there's somebody on the other side that it's actually able to uh, develop this knowledge for profit. And, uh, and this, uh, this is a slide I had from uh, Dr. our dear Dr. Rajguru from, uh, from, uh, from the CTSI. 
Um, just briefly about myself, after I became tenure professor at this institution, I really understood and thought that pharma experience would be in the key to find the cure. So at that time, I developed a company that allowed me to do consulting for several large pharma companies. So I built a strong global network within industry. I, um, I actually established contract agreement or co-development agreement with large pharma companies such as Roche and Boring Ingelheim. So I actually uh, performed discovery science with funding coming from industry, not just from the NIH. Um, the University of Miami successfully outlicensed uh, some of my invention to companies such as the wonderful Zeversa Therapeutic and their team led by Steve Glover uh, that are developing several technology coming from uh, the University of Miami. At that time, uh, you know, I, I was so busy with my academic endeavor, I said, okay, let them develop the invention and I felt like I was giving a baby away. And in this particular case, I felt I wanted to stay closer to my baby and and uh, uh, develop a new compound, fund a new company, and remain involved. And this is actually what uh, Marco and I will be presenting today. Another very important way to interact with the industry, there's an opportunity to train postdoctoral fellows that are from pharma company into academic center. And we are currently training a wonderful postdoc uh, from uh, Gutenberg um, that is sponsored by AstraZeneca and is hired as an employee of AstraZeneca. But so after discussing this, and I hope I convince everybody the importance of working with the industry, we will move to the scientific component of the talk that is really to try to appreciate the science leading to the discovery of fatty kidney disease. Because I'm a nephrologist, obviously I will give, uh, and few people in the audience are, I will give a little bit of a view of this wonderful functional unit that is in the kidney, the glomerular filtration barrier. If we look at capillary loop in the glomerulus and we try to enlarge it, the filtration barrier is constituted by a basement membrane, by podocytes on the urinary side that are thermally differentiated epithelial cells that uh, interdigitate with each other, and the fenestrated endothelium on the broad side. This is a translation, a transmission electron microscopy of our favorite cells, this podocyte, which is these polarized cells that have major processes and food processes that interdigitate with adjacent food processes from a podocyte, um, from other podocyte to form what we call this lead diaphragm as enlarged ear and where the arrow are pointing on the bottom right. But uh, um, as a nephrologist, we also deal with a lot of diseases that are idiopathic, meaning we don't really know what causes them. We don't know the pathogenesis of the disorder. And understanding the path from health to disease is, only, is the only thing that will help us to reverse the disease. So what brings this wonderful podocyte with this wonderful site architecture on the left side to disease podocytes, as we see now on the right hand side, is not known. And as long as that is not known, it will be very difficult to actually um, um, to 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 actually uh, find a cure. One thing that is clear that podocyte injury, these thermally differentiated cells, is uh, something that characterizes uh, several diseases, both uh, a rare and prevalent kidney disease. If we look at the normal um, uh, normal uh, podocyte in green, it nicely sits on the basement membrane with these food processes. If we look at focal segmental glomerosclerosis, you can see that the, the site architecture is lost and the podocyte is flattened. If we look at Alport, a disease that affects primarily male and young adults uh, or adolescents with immaturia and proteinuria, we can see that uh, the basement membrane, uh, because it's a mutation in collagen chain, the basement membrane are altered. And by being so altered, we can have the passage of red blood cells and also a flattening of the food processes of podocyte. And then diabetes, a disorder where the podocyte is flattened and sits on thickened basement membrane. So those are all diseases where podocyte injury and podocyte loss um, represent a problem. And why it's important to prevent podocyte loss? Because it becomes very clear that although in the early stage when we start losing few podocytes, the other podocytes tend to compensate by hypertrophy. Once we lose 20 to 40% of podocyte, the disease 
uh, of the kidney inexorably goes towards end-stage kidney failure requiring dialysis or transplantation. So just a podocyte depletion is sufficient to cause this tubular interstitial fibrosis leading to end-stage kidney failure. And although we don't know the mechanism, these data were actually validated also in patients. In this elegant study done in diabetic kidney disease in the population of American Indians, which are the one most affected by diabetic kidney disease, what Rob Nelson from the NIDDK demonstrated is that the epithelial cell number, the podocytes, are reduced in the early stages of diabetic kidney disease where the patient manifests with microalbuminuria without having an impairment of their kidney function or of their GFR. Not only there is a, a, a reduction in podocyte number, but the podocyte number actually correlate to the albumin excretion rate down the road or to the change of albumin excretion rate over time suggesting a, a cause effect relationship between podocyte number and disease progression. In order to understand what it is that causes podocyte loss in the setting of diabetes, my laboratory several more than 15 years ago patented the method to actually study podocyte in culture as opposed to the zero patient enrolled in natural history studies and longitudinal cohorts. So what we do, we take uh, serum from patients and instead of culturing cells with fetal bovine serum, we culture cells with patient serum. And we uh, study cohorts that are very well homogeneous for all the parameters and that are differentiated only for those patients that develop kidney failure from the patient do not develop kidney failure. And we try to study the molecular signature of this cells in culture, as well as several phenotypic readouts that would allow us then to do also drug discovery and, uh, and to understand whether a liquid biopsy could one day replace the traditional kidney biopsy where uh, the molecular signature may actually be similar overlapping to the one of podocytes in culture. And to my, so the first time we did this, I say we did it with serum of patient with diabetes, both type one and type two diabetes. And you can see that these patients were very well matched for each gender, diabetes duration. They had the same O1C, the same cholesterol level in the circulation. The only difference was really that one subpopulation developed kidney disease, the other one did not. And when we actually uh, did uh, um, uh, microarray studies at that time was microarray, not RNA seq uh, studies in these uh, uh, in these cells, we were able to notice that the molecular signature in cells as opposed to the diabetic milieu of a serum of a patient developed diabetic kidney disease is rather different from the one of a patient that has diabetes without kidney disease. And the pathway that were mostly regulated in the patient that developed kidney failure were inflammation, insulin signaling, apoptosis, and lipid metabolism. And this was probably the very first time in my career I heard about lipid metabolism. And first I said, no, I'm a protein expert. I don't want to hear about that. But the cells keep on coming back and the data keep on coming back, stressing the importance of lipid metabolism. And this is actually when we looked at the, you know, we went from RNA uh, microarray data to actually see whether lipid pathway would be regulated in podocytes. And what we noticed that podocytes that were exposed to the serum of patient with diabetic kidney disease uh, actually tend to, tend to develop, uh, tend to accumulate oil red oil lipid droplets in their cell body. Oil red oil is nothing but a marker of lipid droplets. This was also validated by Philippine staining in orange here that is nothing but a staining for free cholesterol. And you don't need to be a cell biologist to see that these cells also uh, change morphology and add this cauliflower type of appearance. And then by body P, you can see actually uh, little lipid droplets accumulating in the cell body of the uh, podocyte. And there is no question, as we reviewed here in this Nature Review Nephrology paper, that lipids have an important function for the uh, important role for the proper function of the podocyte. If we look at two food processes of a podocyte, this lead diaphragm that allow for the retention of the protein the, to, that prevented the leakage of protein from the blood to the urine. This particular lead diaphragm is composed also of cholesterol, phospholipid, sphingolipid that allow for this uh, slit diaphragm protein to sit properly at the, at the membrane and to engage in homophilic and heterophilic interaction among each other. 
But the question is what happens when there is too much cholesterol or too much lipid accumulating in the cell body of cells. And uh, in fact, in both clinical and experimental diabetic kidney disease, it was described that uh, uh, in patients with uh, uh, diabetic nephropathy, there are lipid droplets accumulating in the cell body of the podocyte. And this was validated in an experimental model of type 1 and type 2 diabetes, where by mass spec, uh, my colleague Moshe Levy was able to demonstrate accumulation of both cholesterol and triglyceride in the kidney cortex. The key question we always got at this time, I say, oh, this must be a consequence of the fact that you're studying diabetes. Diabetes is a dysmetabolic disorder. Uh, most of these patients have hyperlipidemia. Of course, they tend to accumulate lipid. And, and actually this idea of cause, but in, in the concept that lipid may actually accumulate in the kidney is not so novel neither, because if you look at the British Medical Journal from the 80s, uh, it was described that there was a fatty transformation of the kidney with the replacement of renal tissue by true adipose tissue. And in the Lancet in 1982, uh, the suggestion that kidney disease may be mediated by abnormalities of lipid metabolism. So thinking about the possibility of the cause uh, effect relationship between lipid accumulation in the kidney and development of disease. And uh, uh, Exactly because we were challenged by the idea that lipid would accumulate primarily in disease of metabolic origin, we start looking at disease of non-metabolic origin. Focal cement sclerosis and Alport syndrome are diseases that are mostly affecting pediatric patients that have no comorbidity, no cardiovascular issues uh, um, that uh, are often linked to genetic mutation. Alport, as I mentioned, is linked to collagen four mutations and our pathologists often report the presence of foamy podocytes, so lipid droplets in the cell and in the parenchyma of uh, patients affected by Alport and FSGS. And when Jinju Kim, a senior postdoc in my laboratory, isolated podocyte from uh, um, a, a, a mouse model of Alport, she was able to demonstrate in green, in collaboration with Alia San team, the accumulation of lipid droplets in the cell body of this podocyte. And in fact, uh, uh, you know, uh, if we look, if we go back to the patient now, uh, we are part of a national NIH funded study looking at patients with proteinuria where at the time of the kidney biopsy, a sample that utilized to do RNA-seq data. And when we look at the RNA-seq data in the glomeruli of patients affected by focus cemental glomerulosclerosis minimum change disease enrolled in this uh, Neptune cohort led by Matthias Kretzer in Michigan, we were able to demonstrate a variety of genes involving cholesterol influx uh, synthesis and fatty acid oxidation in, uh, as, as a modulated in uh, this glomerular disorder of non-metabolic origin. So Alla and Judith, uh, Alla is now an instructor in the lab. She uh, recently was recipient of a, of a great award from the American Society on Nephrology. And Judith has been a wonderful scientist working for us uh, with us for many years. They actually tested the accumulation of cholesterol in, exp in our experimental model of diabetes, FSGS and Alport. And they were able to demonstrate that in the kidney cortex of these uh, 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 mice, there is actually accumulation of cholesterol. And, uh, um, and the accumulation of cholesterol correlates with albuminuria and can be detected on a tissue biopsy as form of cholesterol crystals and oil red oil lipid droplets. Now, if we want to understand about cholesterol metabolism and entrapment of cholesterol at the intracellular level, uh, the best lesson to learn is from the foam cells that constitute the atherosclerotic plaque. If you look at the foam cells, we can see that these cells actually get filled of uh, esterified cholesterol and lipid droplets and free cholesterol. And uh, uh, that uh, the only way to actually extract this cholesterol from the foam cell of the atherosclerotic tract is through ABC1 transporter that brings free cholesterol to an nascent HDL or uh, through a lecithin acetyl transferase enzyme that generate a mature HDL and that uh, also facilitate additional ABCG1 dependent efflux of cholesterol to the cells. And why do I highlight like these two enzymes? I like these two enzymes because there's nothing as human genetic that uh, to, to actually support the cause effect relationship between a gene and a phenotype. And we were lucky enough that 
Tangier disease and ELCA deficiency are two diseases present in humans that cause premature atherosclerosis with corneal opacity from the accumulation of cholesterol. And but also surprisingly, in these two disorders, both are characterized by impairment of cholesterol efflux, also present with proteinuria and foamy podocytes on a kidney biopsy. And in the case of ELCA deficiency, full-blown nephrotic syndrome leading to end-stage renal disease, really stressing the importance of a cause-effect relationship between lipid cholesterol efflux and, and phenotype. So we went on to characterize that podocyte can actually uptake a cholesterol through the LDL receptor, synthesize cholesterol through the HMG coerylutase, store cholesterol lipid droplets, traffic cholesterol through Neiman peak proteins type C1 and 2, and efflux cholesterol through transporters such as ABCA1, G1, and G8. So why is it that in the data I've shown you before, the podocytes actually uh, sequester cholesterol in form of lipid droplets. So when we actually looked at uh, uh, both diabetic kidney disease, kidney biopsy, as well as podocyte as post deficient serum, and when we look at Alport, uh, experimental Alport in early stage of disease, at six weeks of age when these mice are proteinuric, but they still have a relatively normal GFR, we can see a dramatic downregulation of ABC1 expression same down regulation of ABC1 expression that I've shown you to be involving cholesterol efflux was in the kidney biopsy of patients from the Pima Indian cohort at the NIH, as well as in podocytes as opposed to the serum of the patient. So what Chris Pedigo did in a nice uh, JCI paper that he put out in 2016, he actually developed a mouse model where uh, uh, with uh, of uh, focus segmental glomerulosclerosis where uh, this mouse model was actually transgene for ABC1. So he tried to overexpress ABC1 and he was able to demonstrate that the genetic overexpression of ABC1 is sufficient to rescue mice with focused segmental glomerulosclerosis from the development of albuminuria and from the development of kidney failure. So we knew at that, at that time that ABC1 was a good target for drug development. So this leads us to the third objective of our talk, that, that is to discuss the pathway from target identification to drug development. And I will let Marco take over this part of the talk. Marco. Thank you, Alessia, and thank you for inviting me. Um, in the next three slides, I will walk you over the three, uh, three slides where we present the drug discovery approach. So originally, so original these compounds were discovered with a phenotypic based approach you see on the top panel on the left hand side in fact this uh, this program existed at Roche prior uh, Alessia coming because this comes from a, a deloading program of foam cells so from an atherosclerotic project and uh, the the phenotypic drug discovery uh, is based on the development of a phenotype rather than a target. And here the phenotype was THP1 loaded with radio level cholesterol. And once this cholesterol loaded THP1, uh, they have been admitted to a screen with 2.1 million compounds. This is a standard library of Roche. And uh, we were measuring the efflux uh, of cholesterol. What you see in the middle top panel you see the effect of these five aryl nicotinamide class of compounds, and you clearly see there that there is an efflux, uh, an increased efflux of radio level cholesterol in a dose dependent matter, most efficiently to the lipid poor HDL or to APOA1, as Alessia described before. So, suggesting the idea that this uh, cholesterol efflux is mediated by ABCA1. But of course, you need a, a proof of that. And the proof you have on the right-hand side, on the right-hand side, we perform the experiments, not just in the normal cells, but also in fibroblast of Tanger patients. As described by Alessia before, Tanger patients have stop code mutation for ABCA1. And that's the result that you see presented there in the top right panel for compound H and compound J, which are two representative of this class of compounds. It's very suggestive, I, I would say it's a proof, a very strong proof that this cholesterol reflux is not existent in Tanger fibroblast patients, patient fibroblast. 
on the lower panel, left hand side, what you see is that uh, the compound J, the compound H, so this new class of compounds, and also the T1317 in this case, it's a, sorry for this acronym, is an elixir agonist, uh, in duplicate, they suggest an increased expression of ABCA1. And what you see on the right hand side, on the lower panel, it's very important because what you see there is this um, cholesterol flux efflux is not mediated as in the case of T1317, which is the, still the elixir agonist, it's not mediated at transcriptional level. So that's a major difference uh, compared to the elixir agonist. This work is work of a lot of people, and in particular, I'll make you right, it was the, uh, the leader in this program at Roche. Maybe on the next slide, Alessio. But of course, we wanted to know more about this compound because we, we know that this class of compounds was already identified in a cannabinoid one receptor antagonist program. But we know the Rimonabant, which is a cannabinoid receptor agonist, is not this efflux, is not capable to mediate this efflux. Uh, through ABCA1. So we postulated, we hypothesized at the time that probably this was an off target effect of this compound. So we started from the compound H that you see on the uh, left uh, panel, top panel. And the compound H is the compound I showed the results in the prior uh, slide. And we engineer this compound in the ortho position uh, with an azide, with a trichated azide. And uh, the reason to make this trichated azide was to uh, have now a tool at our ends capable to use for doing proximity ligation with proteins which are interacting with this compound. You might appreciate also that in the transformation from compound H to compound K, thought we have a very similar cholesterol efflux mediated at EC50. What you also could appreciate is that we improved much the selectivity against cannabinoid receptor one. And that's an important element because this made us confident that we were working with something, keeping at bay the cannabinoid receptor one the antagonist problem. So what we did with that, we simply took THP1 lysates and we spike in the trichated azide compound K and we went for a mass spectrometry fishing expedition. From this fishing expedition, you see in panel B, we found a number of candidates. These candidates were then selectively transfected uh, with a plasmid in THP1, re-exposed again to the trichated azide derivative of compound H, and uh, pulled down in immunoprecipitated Ele electrophoresis was performed and autoradiography. And from these, we went down in a smaller list of compounds that you see in panel C on the, on the lower uh, left panel. You see the compound, the, the genes that were screened negative in this uh, uh, transfection approach. You see compounds that were inconclusive, but this compound was uh, these uh, target genes were already very lower in our mass spectrometry enrichment index. And then you see the ones that we have found positive. And uh, the one positive have been screened by competition with the bare compound. An example of this competition you see on the right hand side. The right hand side, you see the same experiment conducted with compound A, so with the trichated compound K. But this time you see the competition for OSBPL7 and was only positive the competition of OSBPL7, you see the competition at 10 and 50 micromolar with the bare compounds, the compound A and compound G. And you appreciate also there that we, uh, we have done this competition with two compounds with very different profile of selectivity against the closest target that we fished in our list. You see is CNR1, which is cannabinoid receptor one. And you see that both compounds, even the most selective one, were able to effectively compete uh, with the trichetic compound. So if you can go to the next slide, Alessia. What those BPL7 proteins are? To be honest, we don't know a lot about the OSBPL7. What we know more in general is of something related to the family, to the class of proteins this OSBPL7 belongs to. These are called the oxysterol binding proteins. Oxysterol binding proteins are shuttling proteins. 
their job is to shuttle lipids across the different membranes uh, from the endoplasmatic reticulum to the Golgi and from those pool of membranes to the plasma membrane. And we know that because if we disrupt uh, physically the interaction between the plasma membrane, those uh, other pool of membranes, the cholesterol is not shuttling correctly to the plasma membrane. So we, we think that this is the putative uh, role of uh, OSPPL7. If you can go on the next slide. But of course, this was not enough. And certainly, this was not enough for the nature communication reviewers. And so we had to go uh, ahead in our uh, effort. And on the panel A, you see a, a enriched set of compounds. The first seven are active. The second series are were inactive in uh, uh, inducing the cholesterol efflux mediated by ABCA1. And you see that those uh, ABCA1 persons of induction at 10 micromolar correlates very, very well with the percentage of inhibition of the bare compounds on the trichetic compound K, which is the second column. Uh, and there is a nice correlation between this activity-activity relation. But of course, this was not enough to demonstrate the physical interaction of this class of compounds with the protein. So what we did, and you see in panel C, uh, what we did was identifying the putative binding site for those compounds in the protein in OSPPL7. So what we did was a, a creation of an, an homology model. Unfortunately, does not exist a crystal of OSPPL7, but all OSPPL7 have a very conserved oxysterol binding, regulatory binding domain. And we could use the ORP1, which is a very related protein. It's only 45% homology at the overall structure, secondary structure, but in the ORP is 79% homology. So quite uh, usable uh, for a homology model. And what you see in panel C, you see an homology model. So this is just a model, it's not a real crystal structure that you are seeing there. And you see the OSBP L7 ORP, so the oxysterol regulatory domain, which bound in our violet or yeah, pink. In pink, you see our compound modeling inside. And in, in the panel C, in the left-hand side, you see an active compound, which is compound M that you have also in the panel A. And on the right-hand side, in the upper panel, okay. Um, but what you see there, I mean, I don't want to go in the uh, uh, crystal structure detail, but we identify the key residues, and the key residues are the lysine in position 636 and the isoleucine in position 641. Why we know that and how we know it? Because we did site directive mutagenesis on those residues, and we know that those residues are really fundamental. And on the panel C, on the upper panel, as I told you, on the left-hand side, you have an active, and the right, on the right-hand side, you have the inactive. We know also what's the difference between an active and an inactive. And there is a, a steric hindrance for the inactive compounds what, with the arginine in position 550. And uh, how we, we think that this compound works, we think that this compound perturb the normal side where cholesterol is binding to this protein. On the lower panel, you see now a model of ORP1 with cholesterol. This is a real crystal that you are seeing there with a cholesterol bound. And you see that the cholesterol is uh, interacting with the position, ASN in position 707, and also with the valley in position 712, which are homologue to the lies in position 636 and the isoleucine in position 641. So we are really confident. And uh, I think we convinced also the reviewer that this is the real binding mode of those compounds after a lot of work of Alessia and her lab. Thank you, Marco. Uh, so I take over from here. So what we did at that stage uh, uh, of this wonderful uh, chemical development at Roche, uh, uh, Miami had an agreement to develop these compounds further. And uh, uh, what Javier, a scientist in the lab did was to test whether these compounds or the top compounds identified compound A and G would also be able to upregulate ABC1 expression in culture podocyte. And so they did. 
with an increase of ABC1 at the plasma membrane. Uh, it was also able to demonstrate that these compounds are um, uh, functional. They're able to actually increase APOE1 mediated cholesterol efflux from culture podocyte in a dose dependent manner, compound G and compound A. Compound C is a LXR agonist uh, that uh, we utilize to as a positive control. So you can see that their efficacy is similar to the one of an LXR agonist. Uh, what Javier also did was able to verify that in total kidney or podocyte, uh, there is actually expression of OSBPL7 and by immunofluorescence localized OSBPL7 with a synaptopodin that is a marker of podocyte to demonstrate that in vivo and in vitro podocyte express the target of the newly identified compounds. At that point, uh, we utilize these uh, small molecules to uh, test in experimental models of disease. We first studied focus mental gonosclerosis uh, that is uh, induced experimentally by giving adriamycin to mice. And this is the albuminuria in uh, uh, adriamycin-induced FSGS and the type of glomerular lesion we usually see. You don't need to be an nephrologist to see that the, that the tubules are filled of protein and the uh, glomeruli are uh, focally or globally uh, glomerosclerotic. Uh, but actually, when we administer the compound G, uh, the mice were just identical to the control. And our blinded uh, nephropathologists that evaluate the slides were able to show that compound G was able to completely abolish glomerosclerosis, segmental glomerosclerosis, podocyte hypertrophy, hyperplasia, tubular inflammation, microcyst formation, and the reduction of mesangial expansion, which also resulted, usually these mice uh, tend to suffer um, because they're severely proteinuric and nephrotic and the compound actually maintain the same body weight of the control. Uh, we, but because the experimental model of FSGS don't resemble as well uh, the uh, human disorder, we went to study another rare genetic disease, Alport syndrome, uh, studies in the laboratory done before have shown that Alport syndrome is a disease of fatty kidney disease and that uh, uh, drugs such as cyclodextrin, which defend the kidney, are effective in the treatment of Alport syndrome. So we wanted to verify whether this compound was also effective in uh, improving kidney function. We saw a dramatic reduction in albuminuria. Serum creatine, blood urea nitrogen were pretty much normal. The body weight was preserved and the mesangial expansion was also totally normal as demonstrated in this representative image of glomerula. You can appreciate the compound treated alpor mice are similar to control uh, mice. Um, in what was more exciting that even when we give the compound at the uh, time that the disease is already established, when these mice are already severely proteinuric with a CKD3 equivalent, meaning a GFR around 40, uh, the compound is able to prolong the survival of these mice that usually died at uh, eight weeks of age for um, uh, kidney failure. And uh, I'm happy to share with you that now this compound is in clinical development and is a phase two trial is planned to start in the third quarter of 2021 after uh, IND approval. Uh, not only the compound was protected in kidney function, but also the compound was able to reduce the accumulation of cholesterol in the kidney cortex and uh, was able to reduce the esterified cholesterol, uh, both in the FSGS experimental model and in the Alport experimental model. And the accumulation of esterified cholesterol correlated to the degree of albuminuria in these uh, uh, mice. Um, the next question is, okay, we have studied this compound now into rare disease, FSGS and Alport. And just to go to the last slides, the question, would this ABC1 inducer also work in more prevalent kidney disease. Uh, for those of you that are not nephrologists, the number one killer of the kidney is diabetes, and diabetic kidney disease is the single most common cause of end-stage kidney failure in the U.S. and globally. So what Michelle Ducasa did, a, a, another graduate student from the pharmacology department working with us that uh, is now postdoc in Maria Breu lab, had a, a wonderful study when, with the cover in JCI in 2019, demonstrated that the compound called here A30 given to DBDB mice, a mouse model of diabetic kidney disease, results in a preservation of podocyte number, in a reduction of the mesangial expansion, 
and in the improvement of this food process effacement by electromicroscopy. Um, what uh, Michelle did, she also demonstrated the compound the reduced albuminuria in the BDB mice, results in a protection from kidney failure with normalization of blood urea nitrogen and reduce the esterified cholesterol content that would accumulate otherwise in the kidney of these mice and validated the idea that it is the esterified cholesterol that accumulate in the kidney cortex that tend to correlate to parameters of uh, kidney function. Stressing the important that yes, it is likely that uh, chronic kidney disease of both metabolic and non-metabolic origin is linked to the accumulation of cholesterol ester in the kidney parenchyma and any strategies that can actually uh, contribute to defend the kidney is likely to be successful. So in summary, um, I hope I've discussed how important it is to have interaction between academia and industry for successful drug discovery. Uh, I've shown you that the impairment of ABC1-dependent cholesterol efflux is a primary contributor to podocyte injury and glomerular disease. And uh, I've, uh, we have shown you that pharmacological modulation of renal lipid metabolism is sufficient to protect from renal failure in kidney disease of both metabolic and non-metabolic origin. And I want to move to the most important slides. Uh, this is a little bit a pre-COVID older uh, uh, pictures of the lab. I just uh, hope uh, we can have a new one soon. Uh, but this is the wonderful laboratory I'm, I'm so glad to lead and so proud to uh, work with. My collaborator at the CAT Center, um, Sandra Mercer, Asana Lali, Alla Mitrofanova, the Roche team led by Marco, Matthew Wright was really the scientist leading this effort at Roche when I joined in 2013. Collaborator from the different department uh, from UM that helped me to embrace this lipid space, although I come from a protein biology background as well as collaborators from all over the world. And needless to say, the supporting entities and the continuous support of the CTSI to promote a culture of translational medicine at this institution. And with that, I want to stop and I'll be happy to take, we'll be happy to take any question. Thank you, uh, Alessia and Marco. Uh, you know, terrific, elegant set of experiments uh, taking from the lab and then your, uh, molecular pharmacology and really developing uh, this drug that sounds like it will go across multiple different kinds of kidney diseases, which is really fantastic. Um, for those, uh, please here um, in the chat, there are questions, if you can put in your questions or raise your hand and uh, the yellow hand, I guess, so I can see, cause I can't see everybody and um, we'll call on you for questions. I, I, I mentioned that you were moving into uh, some human studies. Uh, can, you, can you tell us where you're at now with, uh, you know, I guess, phase one, two, where are you in the development for this uh, great company? So, for, so phase one has already been um, uh, completed and uh, phase two has raised uh, um, sufficient uh, uh, dollars to be conducted. And so we are just waiting for the FDA to give the okay. I just cannot uh, disclose the name of the entity that uh, I will license the compound because these will be disclosed only at time of trial registration in clinicaltrial.gov, which I expect to happen in a few weeks. So there is a question in the chat here, uh, very curious about, oops, no, just move. Um, liquid biopsy approach for diagnosing a podocyte defects. Would the biomarkers be cell-based or exosome-based? or nucleic acid based? So um, Ashutosh, the, the, uh, the liquid biopsy is definitely a very good way. Uh, actually was developed from us with the idea to develop a biomarker of predictor that would be less invasive than a kidney biopsy. The kidney is a very vascularized organ before you stick a needle, if you can have a substitute. However, we fail by trying to validate the biomarker. We fail to have a, a sufficient interest, interest say, variability to move it forward for clinical application. We still do it. I still like to do it for some of my patients. In this particular case, uh, the measure of target engagement is that's where you're going to, will probably be an MRI imaging studies of fat content in the kidney. And we're working with Alan Pollack and his team here in Miami to develop an MRI method to actually detect, to apply the protocol for the fatty liver to the fatty kidney so that we can actually uh, visualize by imaging the defetting of the kidney. Uh, there's another question here from uh, Klaus Wolstek. 
uh, regarding um, what do you know about the distribution of the compound in the body, particularly in the, in the CNS? Marco, do you know? Very low volume of distribution to the CNS. Any other places? Or? But it's a systemic available compound, so we'll go everywhere. Uh, but if the CNS is the concern, it's a very small volume of distribution, so very positive. Um, and then there's a question here regarding, um, have you considered whether multimodal therapy with ARB, ACE inhibitors, um, mm -hmm. for example, might contribute to reduction in proteinuria and prolongation of kidney function? Or I'd even add statins. How would they fit in here since you're talking about cholesterol deposition also? How would okay. that fit in the mix? So thank you. So the, I, I do believe this, uh, Marisa, will be an add-on to the effect of ACE inhibitor and ARB. Uh, strangely enough, uh, we have not reported, but we have actually seen that ACE inhibitor and ARB partially contribute to defect the kidney and uh, reduce some of the cholesterol content. And But to add to what uh, uh, Dr. Sacco asked, uh, actually starting, we, we don't have to confuse what it is to target systemic hyperlipidemia with uh, the lipid that gets entrapped in peripheral organ. So in fact, when we give statin and we target the HMG CoA reductase enzyme, we do not defect the kidney. We do not de uh, reverse the phenotype of cell in culture exposed to patient serum. So yes, we improve the systemic hyperlipidemia, but remember patient with familiar hyperlipidemia, they don't develop proteinuria and kidney failure. So the problem is really in the impairment of getting rid of the cholesterol that by mistake get entrapped in the peripheral organ. I tend to believe that this drug will be beneficial also for atherosclerosis, frankly. Now, not big, I look at them, I'm a nephrologist, so I look at the kidney first, but it would make a lot of sense to look at them in the setting of fatty liver and atherosclerosis as well. And, and maybe just to complete, this compound was originally developed for those. Yeah, you mentioned it. And, uh, and, and you know, the, the beauty of this compound is that it has been derived by phenotypic drug discovery. So, and we put already statins in the counter staining, in the counter screening. So we know that statins are not doing the same. Great. Another question here about clearance of cholesterol through the liver, uh, maybe as effective as inducing cholesterol um, efflux, I think, from the kidney. Yes, so this uh, clearing cholesterol from the liver, we all have seen the development of this beautiful PCSK9 inhibitor that we cannot even randomize our patient to study because we see a dramatic effect on the reduction of their LDL. And PCSK9 is also expressed in the kidney. So the question is whether, whether these compounds would eventually, by interfering with LDL receptor, would actually contribute to defect the kidney. And I think elegant study done here by Lina Shiades also demonstrated the important role of LDL and LDL receptor uptake of cholesterol in the pathogenesis of kidney disease. So, you know, we are focusing on efflux, but it's likely that other pathways are involved. And what about... Um... Side effects. I mean, you said phase one has been done and you're going to move hopefully into phase two. And there's a question here about uh, inducer, uh, any side effects, which renal diseases will be tested in the upcoming phase two trials? So the, there will be two phase two trials starting in parallel, one in Alport, one in FSGS. Um, and the side effect, as you can imagine, you know, some of our cells, the cells need cholesterol. The, plasma, the, the plasticity of the plasma membrane require a proper content of cholesterol. If you think about the cells that is most uh, uh, susceptible to, uh, that needs the most of this plasticity is the red blood cells that circulate so fast and when they have to go through the capillaries, they can break, no? So the concern, I think, every time you develop a, a, a compound that defect cells is that there's not enough fat for that plasticity of the plasma membrane. And hemolytic anemia was, for example, a concern with the very first cyclodextrin that were developed. Cyclodextrin is also nothing but a sugar that removed cholesterol content from the plasma membrane. And hemolytic anemia was described in the early stages, but uh, uh, in the early uh, cyclodextrin, not the new one, not the hydroxypropyl beta cyclodextrin, but the prior one. I do believe, though, that uh, the phase one didn't show any, uh, I mean, I, I know the data in the phase one didn't show any trend to uh, anemia or hemolytic anemia, but obviously uh, we don't know whether treating for a lifetime uh, would have uh, more consequences. And that's why we do clinical research. Right, exactly. <laughs> 
Uh, and then another one here, do standard therapies for proteinuria and diabetic kidney disease, such as, and we heard a little bit about angiotensin, converting enzyme, inhibitors and blockers of sodium glucose transport, upregulate ABCA1 and improve cholesterol efflux. So other drugs and their yes. effects on this mechanism. So Thank you, uh, Gabriel, for this nice uh, um, uh, question. I think for the angiotensin converting enzyme, I already respond. We do have some data that shows some defecting on the kidney. Um, uh, we are working with uh, uh, Beringer Ingelheim to study the effect of SGLT2 inhibitor. You could envision that if you block the glucose absorption in a given cells, you're going to mobilize the lipid that are going to be the fuel for ATP generation. So we're actually testing this hypothesis that SGLT2 inhibitor offer renal protection as shown in the CREDENCE trial, in the DAPA-CKD trial in the New England through defect in the kidney. And for aldosterone blockage, we know the Finerenone study, a Fidelio study was also published with great outcome data. And uh, we, are work, we, we, are, we are talking to Bayer about uh, looking at whether these compounds could also be responsible for, uh, could also cause some defecting of the kidney. And then I guess the last question here about inflammation causing uh downregulation of ABCA1 and reducing cholesterol efflux and why not target um, uh, inflammation ABCA1 and not inflammation? Well, you know, uh, we the, the fact is uh, um, inflammation uh, can be good for a immediate response and can be bad if it's chronic. And every time anti-inflammatory agents targeting TNF-alpha or TNF-alpha pathway or chemokine, chemokine receptor in the kidney space have been developed, have been trying to be developed, they always fail to achieve outcome. And, and I tend to, if you look back at what we published before, we were strong believers that inflammation, insulin resistance would drive everything. And now I have a more centric view in the idea that this uh, fat... Uh, is responsible for the intracellular inflammation that would eventually uh, cause uh, cell damage. But uh, it's probably a dog that bites its tail. And uh, I have no doubt that that's, uh, uh, that's, uh, um, that's the way it, it works. And so. so it's always the tricky part, which comes first. But uh, yes. I think you've, you've really demonstrated nicely, I like an elegant approach here and a new approach uh, for dealing with kidney disease. So again, terrific. Uh, talk and a great example of the power of academic uh, pharmaceutical collaboration. Um, I believe, uh, Raquel, has a question come up or are we done? Usually, sometimes you had a question at the end, but... I think there was one more question. Oh, oh no, no. I, I meant uh, a question regarding uh, satisfaction with the survey. With oh, the, no poll. No, no poll. poll today. No, oh yeah, one last question here then. Oh, hearing loss has been reported as a potential side effect of cyclodextrin. Any comments about this? Well, I probably don't know enough uh, about this, but yes, it has been reported and also has been found in the Neiman Peak uh, study. Um, I don't know, I think uh, there's people from the diverse therapeutic team on the call, if uh, they may know more than me as they are developing uh, uh, this uh, for kidney disease. I'm not. Uh, um, I'm not aware of the specific data, Efren. I'm sorry. That's okay. So again, thank you, um, Alessia. Thank you, Marco. And again, good luck. And we look forward to hearing more as this moves into further uh, human studies. Fantastic work. Congratulations. Thank, thank you, everybody, for attending, and thank uh, Dr. Sacco for the kind introduction and the invitation. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Been nice. Thank afternoon. you.